it's not fun in the moment when you lose a game like that. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, if we're pushed every night like this, it's going to sharpen us, you know, and be good for us in the long run. But, um, you know, you got to play through that and find a way to win. And it's, it's, it's a tough one to, to lose, even though we was up 20 uh, on the road. It's a tough one, and a tough one to lose, but we better leave that one here and get, get ready for Friday. I think it's one that we uh, just flush it. You know, we all know what we're supposed to do um, you know, from an individual standpoint and, and at a team standpoint. Let me move on and get ready for Friday. Uh, actually, I think it was 26 mellow, uh, but point still stands. Um, so <laughs> the Lakers choke one away against the previously winless uh, Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, so both the finals huh. locks, both the betting favorites, preseason betting favorites, the Nets that we just finished talking about, and as well as the Lakers, don't look so good out the out the gate. And uh, Chris Maddox from Sports Illustrated is here. We'll get back to the Nets in a second, but let's start with the Lakers, Chris. Great shirt, by the way. Um, let's start with the Lakers. Um, I, I've just seen LeBron James. I know he hasn't played the last couple of games. I've just seen LeBron James figure it out far too often when it seemed like there was some redundancy, whether that was D Wade, whether it's Kyrie Irving, whoever the personnel is, LeBron always seems to figure it out. So while there is cause for concern specifically defensively and as it relates to shooting deficiencies with the Lakers, we knew that coming in. I don't want to panic. Uh, how about you? Uh, should we actually be taking his slow starts more seriously? No, I don't think you can panic with the Lakers until after Christmas. That's kind of the deadline I've mentally given this team before I make any kind of sweeping judgments on where they are. There's too many new faces, uh, a new superstar, and you're still missing two key players from that rotation in Trevor Reza and Taylor Horton Tucker. So let's see them get together. But I will say, guys, Everything we thought was flawed about the Lakers in the offseason when they put this group together in the preseason when they went 0 7, it's still flawed. They're still having a lot of trouble getting stopped. This was a team that ranked number one in the NBA last season in defensive efficiency. They're in the bottom third of the league right now. This is a team yeah. that doesn't have floor spacers out there on the court and they're insisting on playing DeAndre Jordan and Dwight Howard some combination of 30 ish minutes every single game taking a spot for a shooter out of that lineup so it is early for this Laker team to decide what they are but the fears that we had coming in have been realized at least early on you know what uh, Mike and Chris I'm not going to overreact to the absence uh, the greatest player in NBA history, of course, that's LeBron James. We all Damn. know that, right? We all agree on that. Uh, <laughs> you, I thought you, I thought you can't. <laughs> just, you can't just slide that kind of thing in. That's not a pass. Go ahead, Mike. Continue. <laughs> okay, like, just, just, I know. I, I want to see if you're paying attention, Mike. That's all. I just want to see if you're paying Always, always. Uh, but no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Maddox, you know, I, I don't think LeBron is ever going to slip with his skills. Maybe the slippage with LeBron James is before you could just always count on him rock solid. He's going to be healthy. He'll be there when it counts. And maybe when we look at this guy who's going to be 37 in December. Is this what we, we should look forward to? Hey, when LeBron's out there, he'll be great, but we can't always say LeBron's going to be out there when we expect him to. Well, I mean, some of the injuries of the last couple of years have not been, at least in my mind, signs of erosion, physical erosion. He had uh, a player in Atlanta fall on his ankle. He sprained the same ankle uh, in right. a game the other night. So these are kind of unfortunate injuries rather than, in my mind, indications of something chronic happening uh, with LeBron James. But you, you brought up the point, guys, earlier about how LeBron always makes it work. And you're right, he has. He goes to Miami. He makes it work. He goes back to Cleveland. He makes it work. But in those situations, he had talent where you could kind of see how it works. Like you needed Dwayne Wade to take a step back. You needed Chris Bosch to play the five. But that team was a good fit alongside each the other. The solutions Fast were forward. there. Yeah, the solutions were there. Fast forward to Cleveland. Kevin Love is your floor spacing big. Kyrie Irving has to get used to playing in a winning situation after being part of a loser for the previous three years. So you could see how it works. This group, I don't see how it works. Like, you're not going to tell me that over the course of the next few months, 
Russell Westbrook is going to turn into a lethal three-point shooter. You're not going no. to tell me that Russell Westbrook is going to become better off the ball than he's been for the entirety of his NBA career. You're not going to tell me that the likes of Kent Bazemore and Austin Reeves and some of these other guys are going to be dangerous enough from the outside to take pressure off LeBron and, Jay and Davis and force teams not to shrink the floor. I mean, go back and watch some of these games. I mean, the Oklahoma City loss was horrible. That was one of the worst losses I've ever seen. Oklahoma City has zero interest in winning games this year. They are all in on the number one pick already in next year's draft. And they rallied to win that game against the Lakers. But watch how teams are defending Westbrook. They're not within 10 feet of him. They're creating a four on five yeah. situation in the half court because they don't believe Russ can make three point shots. So I just, I saw how it would work in Miami and Cleveland. To this point, I don't see how it works in Los Angeles. So it sounds like the road we're headed down, and you said you give it till Christmas before you actually mm. push the panic button. But the panic, panic button, you know where it is. You're not pushing it, but you know exactly where it is with this Lakers team. And you yeah, might absolutely. push it around Christmas. But it sounds like we're looking at some kind of roster move, some kind of significant addition, either via trade or buyout market. Uh, uh, or some kind of addition that this team can upgrade its shooting and therefore its floor spacing as well as Frank Vogel figuring out rotation. So what is this team's capability when it comes to tinkering around the edges around those three superstars? Well, it's extremely limited to say the least. The Lakers don't have young assets. They've got Taylor Horton Tucker who they don't want to trade because they think he's part of their present and future. Beyond that, they don't have a lot of draft capital that they can just dole out, not that it's all that valuable uh, to begin with. And three players are gobbling up the lion's share of their cap space in LeBron Westbrook and Anthony Davis. So their best bet at improving the roster probably comes around the buyout market time. Maybe someone like a Kevin Love breaks free from Cleveland and he adds something floor spacing to that mix. Maybe it's somebody else, but they're going to have competition for those, uh, those buyout guys. I mean, Brooklyn's still going to be lurking out there. Miami's playing great basketball early on. These are places players want to go and want to play. So for me, the improvement has to come or, or situationally, rotationally. Specifically, you got to play Anthony Davis as the center for like 75% of the game. It has to happen. Davis has been reluctant to do it for most of his career, but this team does not create enough space on the floor when DeAndre Jordan and Dwight Howard are on it. AD has to be the center. LeBron has to be the power forward. And if you're going to play Russ with them, those other two spots have to be taken up by shooters. So I refuse to give Michael what he wants and use the excuse for my Brooklyn Nets that they're missing Kyrie Irving. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just they got enough. They got, they got Kevin Durant and James Harden or whoever is impersonating That's James enough. Harden. That's all you need. That's it. And That's give credit to the Heat. Miami, the Miami Heat, a lot of people's dark horse Eastern Conference team, they play great defense. What are you seeing out of Brooklyn so far? Uh, and whether or not this is just some early season hiccups or like the Lakers, do they have problems uh, that won't be fixed uh, by just playing more the same? Well, what worries me about Brooklyn so far are two things. One is the James Harden rule change, basically. Like, uh, James Harden is not adjusting to the new life in the NBA where they're not going to call fouls that he just, when he just hurls his body into guys. You think about it, he's averaging three free throw attempts a game this season. In nine, or it's nine of the previous 11 years, he averaged double digits in free throw. So that's a big jump. Most of his years in Houston, he was getting to the free throw line 10 plus times per game, and he is an excellent free throw shooter. So he was getting a lot of points off those opportunities. He's mm -hmm. got to adjust. Defensively, they weren't great last year, but fast forward to the playoffs. They were a pretty good defensive team. You look at the numbers. They were in the top Thank two or you. three in defensive efficiency in that postseason. This year, they've been nothing close to it. And you would think they'd be a little bit better. LaMarcus Aldridge is back into this mix. Uh, Paul Millsap is a solid low post defender. They've still got the same guys. Kevin Durant uh, is there. Bruce Brown is an excellent defender. They're in the bottom third, and, and that's got to change. Like, you're not going to win in today's NBA without being at least an upper half of the NBA defense, and the Nets have not been that. I'm so glad you're here.
I'm so glad you, <laughs> you're here and we're talking about this. I, I mean, I could talk about this all day. I won't. I won't. This is so much fun. Hey, Chris, do you hear anything about Kyrie's return? Is is that imminent? Is it? Is he just dug in? What what, what are you hearing? So I, I will say this: accessing information in Kyrie's orbit is difficult because he doesn't have a big circle. It's basically his father and a couple of close family members, and they're sure not talking about where Kyrie's at. The Nets. From when I the conversations I've had with people around that organization, they have not been given any indication that Kyrie Irving is changing his stance anytime soon. What the Nets have been hopeful of is that without their involvement, a hands-off approach, Kevin Durant, his close friend, will get to him. Kevin Durant, mm -hmm. who is vaccinated, who got vaccinated in part because of you know this exact circumstance. He didn't want to be in a situation Kyrie Irving is in that Kevin Durant kind of talked to him and said, look, I know you've got a strong position on this. We need you back out there on the floor. We have a chance to do something special. And that Maybe that's what last night was about. Maybe, maybe that's what maybe last night possible, was about. But they, you know? they've, that, that really is Brooklyn's primary yeah. hope here. They're not going to pressure him because right. they know it doesn't work. Uh, the city of New York is not changing its mandate anytime soon. So the hope is that Kevin Durant and players on that roster will be able yeah. to influence Kyrie Irving. Say it publicly, that certainly helps. And, and that's really interesting. And I had a quick, uh, quick follow on the Harden thing. <laughs> I know I'm laughing. But I'm serious uh, on this. My serious question, <laughs> Mike, come on, man. Um, it's do you think the NBA will continue with this? Because I know in the NFL, they'll have a point of emphasis for half the season. Then the officials just forget about it and it's business as usual. How about the NBA? Do you think they will consistently stay with something that James Harden has relied on and built his game around for the last five or six years. Oh, they are all in on this rule change. I had a conversation about this with Marty McCutcheon, who's the head of referees uh, last month. And he said, this isn't like, you know, a knee jerk reaction to last year's playoffs or last year in general. This is something they've been studying for several years now. And they believe this will help with the flow of the game. And you know what? They're right. Like yeah. nobody wants to see you know, a game slowed down by non-basketball moves. I mean, how many times have we seen already guys like Chris Paul or Steph Curry or Trey Young try to do that move with a dribble in front of a guy and let the guys plow into him? Well, they're not calling that anymore either. So yeah. these guys are all going to have to adjust because just like when the NBA eliminated that swing-through move that guys like to do to catch the arm yeah. of, a, of a player, this rule change is going to be in effect permanently the people I've talked to within the NBA are extremely happy with the early results of this rule change. I derive great pleasure from watching guys try to do what they used to get away with and don't get the call or as the case of Patrick Beverly last night, get an offensive foul call. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I actually enjoy that it. Was, so that was, a, that, was like, that was a great example. That, I, like, that I love play, it. like we see we see those guys for years. We've seen guys do that. Trey Young last year actually jumped his free throw numbers significantly. It was probably like five or six extra attempts he had per game, in part because he mastered that. He studied what Chris Paul did, and he was able to stop on a dime and let a guy kind of crash into him from behind. This has, uh, this has totally changed that yeah. dynamic, and the NBA is very happy about it. The flow, again, has been a lot better in these games so far. And look, you want, Absolutely. if a guy gets fouled, he gets fouled. That's fine. But Get fouled making a basketball play. Don't get fouled just trying to draw contact. That's no fun. Couple more things. We have some fun with you. Couple more things before we let you go. I really want to hit uh, one. On the flip side, turning back the clock. Uh, Knicks Bulls back in the '90s. You know they both look really good so far. Uh, whether it's the Knicks specifically on offense and being bombs away from three point land or the Bulls being undefeated for the first time since the Jordan days. Uh, they, they go at it tonight. Which is which which team is more for real? If the answer is both, that's fine. Are both are, are both of these hot starts sustainable for these two teams? So I think the Knicks hot start is sustainable for some reason. And I'm not a big sports gambler guys, but when I was in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, they had the Knicks one loss record. The over under was like 41 and a half, which blew my mind. They won 41 games last year in a 72 win season. So they're not going right. to win more than that in an 82 game season. I didn't understand that one bit. Now the logic was the Eastern Conference is better. The Knicks might be better, but the record will be worse. Uh-uh. The Knicks 
are still going to be a high-level defensive team. They are. Yep. Adding Evan Fournier and Kemba Walker, the Celtics cast-offs, has made them better offensively, specifically Fournier, who has quite literally already won them at least one game, the season opener, against Boston with his shooting uh, in that contest. So I think the Knicks are going to be in that mix for a top four or five seed in the Eastern Conference. I'm still, though, in wait-and-see mode with Chicago, largely because yeah. there's not a lot well. of... Great def There's not a lot of great defenders on that team either. Like, Nick Vucevic is a terrific offensive player, not a great defensive player. Zach Levine, great score, has not been a great defensive player to date. Maybe this is the year it all comes together and some of these younger guys take big steps forward, but this is not a team that looks like one built to get stopped. So I'll need to see more of them before I buy into Chicago as anything more than just kind of a 7-8 play-in type of team. Last thing, speaking of te steps forward and it all coming together, Miles Bridges. This is a thing. This 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 guy's putting up thirty every other night. I mean, we got four, thir three or four thirty point games already. Is Miles Bridges a thing? I love Miles Bridges. I was talking to James Borrego, the coach of the Hornets, on Tuesday on the phone about this, and like he, he was telling me, there's no secret sauce to Miles Bridges. I mean, he came into the league in 2018 as the 12th pick in the draft, and he just started working, and he has worked relentlessly. Ever since he has built himself into being a mid 40% three point shooter at this stage. He is already one of the best athletes in the entire NBA, but he has polished his game to the point where he's looking like an all star player right now. And I think it is sustainable. One thing Borrego said to me uh, about Miles Bridges this season, as bad as it was last year when the Hornets lost LaMelo Ball and Gordon Hayward in the tail end of the season, which cost them positioning and ultimately cost them a full playoff spot. It gave Miles Bridges a chance to be the man. It gave him a chance to be in big situations with the ball in his hands to create offense for himself and others. And he has used that experience as a springboard going into this season. So now you have the Miles Bridge from the end of last year. You've got LaMelo Ball back. You've got Gordon Hayward playing as close to what I've seen him play to his Utah days as he had in the past. This is a team with a lot of offensive firepower, and Miles Bridges is a big part of that. Three 30-point games. You just went for 30, 10, and 10, dude. Thank you for emptying your notebook with us. <laughs> yeah, Always a pleasure having you, man. Thanks for making us smarter. Chris Maddox from Sports Illustrated. We'll talk to you later, brother. Thank you. You got it, man. Hey, thanks for watching, brother, from another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave, and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.